Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, I hope you're keeping well, staying fit and healthy and maintaining your social distancing and not going too sir crazy just yet. If you have children in the household, you're probably wondering, will it ever end? So, for this week's Real Health, I've enlisted the help of Ireland's leading child psychologist and adjunct associate professor of psychology in UCD, David Coleman, to give us tips and advice to help you and your children stay healthy over the course of the COVID-19. David, how are you? Welcome to Real Health. How's it going? Yeah, it's good enough. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you again, uh, although at uh, quite a distance, not our normal, uh, usual chat. <laughs> We're virtually meeting now. Uh, I haven't seen you for a little bit. Tell me, how are you and, and uh, the family doing down in Clare? Good, yeah. Well, we're a little bit split up. Uh, so my eldest two are uh, living up in Dublin. So one of them has decided to stay up in Dublin. One of them's come home. But um, yeah, so we're surviving. I'm kind of lucky, I think, you know, I mean, obviously we're going to be talking about children, but my children are now teenagers and older. So um, actually it just gets a little bit easier. They're, they're a little bit less demanding. They just want food, a lot of food. Um, so yeah, we're doing okay. So it's an incredibly trying time for families around the country. Um, we're not into lockdown down if it may come but it's certainly close enough to it schools are off child minors are off um it's mayhem i'm sure in family for families around the country what can they do to you know to manage the situation yeah i think you're right i think it's just pre- presented this massive challenge for almost every family because even um even though lots of parents are in a position that they can work from home you know the actual balancing of work and their their minding their kids there is proving really really difficult i i do um, kind of a Facebook Live thing and a Q&A. And so I get qu- questions in all about this kind of stuff. And, and one of the big things is often like, how do I keep my three-year-old and my five-year-old entertained without me? Uh, because parents need to get their own work done. So I think it is just a real balancing act for lots of parents. Some parents, I think, are probably in a lucky position that actually they can use this as just a time to really strengthen their connections with their kids. So it's, it is a bit of a bonus. They mightn't have had this kind of length of time with their children other than um, maybe planned holidays. So, um, yeah, so I think it's, it's probably a mixed bag. But um, I, I think in lots of families, there's a lot of children who are probably quite bored now after about two weeks. To begin with, I suppose I want to ask you around uh, dealing with the information overload uh, for children and how parents and families can discuss that with their children, the best ways with which to do that. Because presumably if parents are anxious, children can pick up on that and they get anxious too. So what's the best way to have those conversations and are there any kind of ways to phrase it or word it that maybe make it a little bit easier for children? Yeah, so again, it's going to depend obviously on their age in terms of how you're going to discuss anything with them because you've obviously got to be attuned to your child and their developmental level in terms of what you're trying to say and what you're trying to explain. But I guess, you know, certainly with older children and with teenagers, as much of what you're doing is actually finding out what do they know? What kind of information are they gleaning? Because once they have access to the internet, um, then they're getting information independently of you. You know, you're not really in control of what information is coming to them. Um, And so that means checking in with them about what have they understood what what do they think is actually happening what are the fears that they might have either about the virus and um, what are their fears about you know for, for those who are in exam years you know are they concerned about their exams at this stage most probably are because they're probably looking thinking can these exams actually go ahead um, and so yeah so, so we don't know what our children are going to be frightened of or we don't know what impact this is going to have on them until we start talking to them about it but the one thing I know um, I suppose over the years is that sometimes when we ask questions of kids it just puts them on the spot they feel a kind of a social pressure to respond Mm -hmm. and so sometimes what you get is a resistance because you know maybe they don't know what the answer is to the question you're asking so you say you know how do you feel about this virus and they go I don't know. I, I, I can't tell you what I feel. Uh, and so then you get a bit of back, a kickback, you know, and, and so there maybe just seem a little bit resistant or, or they don't want to engage. So way easier for parents to actually um, make statements because, again, we tend to know our children. Um, and so we probably have a good idea when they seem out of sorts. So you now, of course, again, so much, so much of the circumstances are changed now uh, in terms of kids being off and whatever uh, and, and not able to hang out with their friends in the way that they used to. But, but that aside, you know, we're still going to be able to tell if their behavior, for example, seems very different, if they're, if they're more irritable than they would normally be. Um, because those are often signs that something is on their mind. And so rather than asking them what's on their mind, we can just make statements about what we think is on their mind. So if we have a good old guess of what we think is going on, it's actually way easier for them. It's like um, 
what we offer them, it's almost like a, a like a selection box or a multiple choice of, you know, well, I'm guessing maybe that uh, you're kind of stressed out about the fact that you can't hang out with your friends. That's probably been really difficult for you. And so a child then can kind of go, oh my God, you know, and then they tell you everything about how difficult it is without their friends. Um, or they go, ah, no, sure. Like, you know, I only ever snapped them anyway. Like, it's, you know, it's not like I care about me. <laughs> Um, or again for the younger children you know it might be that they again really connect in with that feeling and they go oh my god yes and it's not fair and I can't do this and when we go outside you won't even let me run over to my friends and uh, and, and all the stuff that will come out so I think um, yeah rather than and than asking them lots of questions you know we, we can be pretty savvy I guess in, in what we can guess is going on for them so just try saying that you know and um, if they if they look like they're going stir crazy say that to them and say things like you know it's, you look like you're getting pretty stir crazy and it sounds like it's time for us to get outside you know and then just go outside be outside do stuff outside and then come back in you know okay so being honest is a crucial thing then and being honest with your child about what you're observing and using that as a tool to get yeah. that conversation going yeah to a certain extent <laughs> so um honestly we sometimes have to limit the amount of honesty we might give particularly young children because we don't want to overwhelm them with information and so they're thinking in a very concrete way they're thinking um about what's happening right now here in my house what i'm seeing what i'm doing what i'm touching what i'm tasting as opposed to big concepts about uh you know physical distancing social distancing and all that kind of stuff they they, they don't necessarily care too much about the concept so we need to be quite pragmatic in terms of just a describing the concrete stuff about here's the plan for today. This is what we're going to do. This is where we're going to go. This is how we're going to do it. These are the things we can't do um, or whatever it might be. And sometimes again, even with small kids, you might actually do it like a kind of a pictorial plan for your day, you know, do it up on a, on a nice chart or, you know, put a few A4 pages up on the wall with a different page for each kind of activity or stage of the day as you plan it. Um, and then your kids can follow along. And so they're not going to be kind of, when are we doing this or why aren't we doing that? Or when's this or what are we, can I do this? Can I do that? You know, that, that helps to slow some of that down but just coming back to the bit about um children and and the amount of honesty so um so yes so we might not necessarily give small children all of the information but the other thing that's going to influence what we say sometimes is our own anxiety you've already mentioned it and sometimes when we ourselves are highly anxious about something what we actually transmit is all of our anxiety and so something that actually might be um, comparatively low risk can seem really high risk if we seem really agitated or upset or and um, worried about it so we have to do an awful lot of managing of our own um emotions i think i was on the late late show there a while back and um i mentioned about chickens and I, I probably no harm for your listeners as well to 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 hear this one because i think it's a really good way to get it because when they look at um if you ever frighten a chicken it goes into what's called tonic immobilization so it literally gets frozen in fear so it's, it just can't move and so if during the time that it's frozen in fear which might be about 30 40 seconds another chicken happens along if the the second chicken sees that the first chicken is frightened and goes, oh shit, what's that? Like, oh my God, there must be something bad. The second chicken also gets frozen in fear. No. And so you've got two chickens now tonically immobilized. So they're literally just <laughs> eyes moving. And of course they're cross-referencing each other. And so the first chicken now sees the second chicken and goes, I knew it. There's your man. He's gotten stuff to do. Oh shit, it must be really bad. The second chicken's looking at the first chicken going, well, he hasn't unfrozen yet. So it must, you know, the, the danger isn't passed yet. <laughs> If, and this is the truth of it, if, um, <laughs> if a second chicken happens along, I know it's kind of weird, but anyway, if a second chicken happens along and sees that the first chicken is frozen in fear, but can't see any danger, and so decides, well, okay, there's a frozen chicken, I don't know why it's scared, and it pecks about its business, the first chicken sees that the second chicken is very calm and collected, and it unfreezes straight away. So we need to be this calm second chicken for our kids. So if they are, you know, stressed or hyped up about what's going on, the calmer, more collected we can be, the easier it is for them. And so even if we ourselves have some anxiety, if we can regulate it enough, um, then we can give this kind of calm message to our kids, which just helps them process and make sense of this, you know, pretty yeah, complicated stuff. Um, I can see listeners all around uh, the country Googling or YouTubing chickens and frozen chickens. Over yeah, the well, actually, that. Lawrence. Yeah, it's, so it's a Dr. Lawrence Cohen is the <laughs> American psychologist whose uh, whose book that's in. And uh, yes, yeah, so I got it off him. I'm not going to claim any ownership for that. But I think I think you should do a Facebook Live of the two chickens and, and scare yeah, one. We're not going to. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we can track down a link. Yeah, you can. 
you can attach it whenever you're promoting this. You can you can put out a few uh, <laughs> links to. Well, no, but on a practical sense, I suppose it, it makes sense in terms of if someone's positive, you want to be around them because they make you feel positive. Or if someone's or from a health perspective, what I would say to my clients, you know, hang around with the people who go to the salad bar for lunch as opposed to the chipper because you're more likely to go to the salad bar as opposed to the yeah. chipper. So it makes it makes logical sense. And um, let's talk teenagers. Yeah. So. Um, Tough times for any family, but presumably tough times for those potentially with teenagers as well, because they can dissect the information and they can see huge events online and stuff. So what, what tips do you got for parents for teenagers? So again, um, you know, the big thing with teenagers is actually spending time with them. Uh, and so I think sometimes <laughs> because they don't, uh, now this is going to send prejudice against all teenagers and I, and I don't intend that, but like, you know, we have a kind of a perception that teenagers are a bit monosyllabic and a little bit reluctant to actually hang out with us as parents. And that might be true sometimes, but actually they've, still, they, they've shown in different studies that just spending time with teenagers, even if it's not engaged in any kind of conversation, but just simply the amount of time you can spend with a teenager uh, is related to the quality of your relationship with them. So the more time you spend the better the quality of your relationship with them so what that means is you know part of what we need to do as parents with our teenagers is not leave them isolated locked away in their bedrooms even though that might be where they want to retreat to but we do have to try to encourage them out encourage them to come down spend time in the social rooms in the house around you know the kitchen table and uh, try to get them coming out walking you know just for a little bit of exercise um, you know, and, and again, I don't want to tar all teenagers with the same brush because, you know, there are lots of teenagers who are now um, absolutely going mad on calisthenics, you know, looking at every single YouTube video and suddenly, you know, they're kind of, uh, you know, vertically or horizontally out from a pole, you know, <laughs> with these enormous abs or whatever. So you know, there are lots of teenagers who are definitely taking the time, uh, you know, to, to do stuff that's actually going to ultimately be good for them. Um, but I think there is a danger, absolutely, that teenagers just get caught up in in the, the, the flood of information that comes. And so they are equally potentially overwhelmed by that. So again, it's about just trying to dissect with them, you know, what kind of stuff are they hearing? What sense are they making of it? Um, and then just checking in whether that has any kind of personal relevance or bearing on them and, and their sense of their personal safety, for example. Are there any uh, obvious behavioral signs to look out for, for your, with, with your children? Presumably, yeah. you know, something that them being different or behaving differently, but is there anything else obvious? Yeah, well, sleep is often a big one. Um, so when we see changes in sleep, um, particularly when children are either more restless in their sleep, when they're um, finding it harder to get to sleep or they're waking in the night, that's usually an indication of some kind of, you know, psychological kind of, uh, you know, stresses there that there, there's something churning over in their head usually. Um, now, I say that and, and I also know that with a lot of children now who are perhaps cooped up more than they would otherwise be and not getting as much just running around stuff that maybe actually they just have a little bit more energy to burn and so maybe they're finding it hard to get to sleep or to get to bed as well. But, but sleep is often a, a good indicator when that gets disturbed that a child might be actually worried or anxious about something. Um, I think typically we can see that children's behavior changes. So if we think of a, a child as having like an inner emotional world, so they have a place where they store all their feelings. What tends to happen if we think of the, about those feelings as like different colors um, of paint. So if you mix red and yellow and blue together, you get a muddy brown or a black. If you mix a series of difficult feelings, so, so if we can imagine, so fear might be in there for sure, frustration at things that they're not allowed to do, uh, disappointment maybe at things that they're now no, no longer able to do, um, you start mixing those kinds of difficult feelings together and what you often get then is the emotional equivalent of a muddy brown or a black, which is anger. And so you often get these blah, big anger outbursts coming. Um, so that can often be another indicator for, uh, for parents that if you suddenly find that your child is an awful lot more irritable um, and it's not just because they're spending so much time with their siblings, uh, that it's, it's actually to do perhaps with a worry or a background something, that, that can be uh, the indicator. So if you see changes, to be honest, it, it, it's almost as if, if you see changes in any aspect of what was a fairly stable behavior for your child, you have to think, hmm, I wonder why that is. And as soon as you start to wonder why that is, we can often put two and two together and get four. Sometimes we put two and two together and get five and we get it wrong. And, but even as I, you know, if we go back to that idea of guessing what might be up for our kids, it actually doesn't matter if we guess wrong. They still value and appreciate the fact that we're trying to guess. So it's worth trying to guess anyway. One of the things you mentioned earlier on was around structure. And, you know, even kind of visualizing on a chart on the wall, a structure for the day. 
Any tips in terms of how that looks? So in terms of, you know, maybe limiting screen time, having a certain amount of play time or activity time or for, for, for parents who, who want to put that structure together? Yeah, so definitely, um, you know, we, we, we tend to, as humans, follow a, a circadian rhythm, you know, so, so we tend to be more wakeful during the daylight hours and we tend to be more sleepy during the, the darker night hours. So particularly, again, with teenagers, and I've spoken to a few teenagers whose, whose cycles have just completely flipped. It's like they're just night owls now and, and they're staying in bed for half the day or, or more of the day. We want to keep our kids getting up at roughly the same kinds of times that they used to get up as because that is about stability for them. Um, you know, it's difficult. Some, some schools have been very proactive and they've given uh, worksheets home or, or homework home or, or schoolwork to be done at home. Um, some haven't to the same extent. Uh, some kids are really into kind of doing a bit of stuff because it's nice to have a bit of a focus. Some aren't. And, and so I think homework has become almost our school schoolwork at home has become a bit of a bugbear in, in quite a few houses. So I would be tempted to say to parents, look, do your best with it. You know, if, if there is work coming home, by all means, you know, keep your kids focused on it. Remind them that this is just, you know, a short period in their otherwise long educational careers, but it's useful to stay a little bit focused. And so if you can set a little bit of time aside in the morning to do some maybe structured kind of school work based on whatever it is the teachers are sending home that's good then you have your snack times then you have lunch time and then I would suggest that you do something completely different for your afternoon if you can at all so maybe something practical something that involves doing or making or going or being somewhere different so again obviously we've all to be a little bit more careful in terms of the physical distance we keep with you know between ourselves and other families and so um, you know you'll have a sense of your neighborhood and, and your locality so so look at what else seems to be happening in terms of when when are other kids out and about on the road and so that mightn't be the best time to bring your kids out and about on the road because they're going to be so tempted to just want to hang out so so we can use that and so we might have to to fiddle our own schedule around about when we think it's going to be quieter or, or we're more likely to be able to do some stuff ourselves as a family without necessarily as i say this temptation to want to hang out with lots of other families um and so yeah, but to be honest, you know, there's so many, like if, if you have any kind of a garden, you know, this is a great time of year to be out in the garden because there's a lot of stuff growing and, and you know, and, and I think, again, whenever we have this sense of potential doom and gloom about something really horrendous like the coronavirus there, it's nice to know that life actually keeps ticking over and that there's growth and there's there's beauty to be found. And I think that's nice for kids as well and, and good for us to feel like we're doing something positive in terms of growth and development um, as well. So gardening is actually a great thing. And not that I would ever claim to have any kind of green fingers. <laughs> green fingers. <laughs> um, well, one, one of the images that was just on, on the back of that strikes me over the last kind of maybe week or so is the footage that was on the news, I think, last last Friday, maybe last Saturday, was the images of Venice and fish back in the canals. Yeah. For the first, yeah. I was uplift. I was nearly welling up watching it. I was nearly getting emotional just watching the, the fish going through the canal. In fact, that nature, you know, it, it, there, was, there was a real sense of positivity from it. It was yeah. amazing to watch it. Yeah, and, and they were talking about how, you know, in certain parts of China now, suddenly the, you know, the, the atmosphere is so much less polluted because some of the big factories have been closed and stuff are, are on, unreduced. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, nature regenerates for sure. Um, you know, I mean, I think if, if the human race got wiped out, you know, the earth certainly wouldn't. The earth would keep ticking over. And so I guess that's a good thing, you know. It'd be nice that we stay with it. Um, but, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it, it is great for us to focus on something that has a little bit of hope um, in it as well because that's one of the things I think that can take a bit of a knock and um, when we see that there's just one perhaps more negative bit of news after another negative bit of news and so suddenly we start to lose hope and and of course it's really critical that we hold on to hope and, and so that's part of our job as parents as well is to remain hopeful about that this will come to an end now you know we can't of course predict exactly when we're certainly not the experts on that. Um, but we do know that, um, you know, this tends to follow a fairly predictable pattern and that at some point, uh, you know, the, the spread of the virus is going to stop and it's going to reduce. And so there will come a time. We can be pretty confident about that. And so that's the kind of thing we have to remember with our kids. Not that we rush into reassuring them about that, but just that we always remember to add that in um, after we've helped them, you know, maybe talk about some of the things that aren't working well at the moment, that we do remember that the hope at the end of it. The final question I have for you, I know it's one that all our listeners will be asking me to ask you, is around screen time. 
both in terms of screens, i.e. TV screens, but also phones and how that works. Now, I'm conscious that you and I are on a screen. I've been on a screen since 7 o'clock <laughs> yeah. this morning. But in terms of children, are there kind of guidelines and timeframes and stuff that is normal, for want for a better word? Um, there are when times are normal. Times are not normal. So I would say to parents, look, you do what you have to do at the moment. And so, you know, digital babysitters, I've, I've long and often written about digital babysitting and how terrible it is and, and how we want to try and, and, you know, not rely on it. But actually, I think sometimes we just have to do needs most at times. And I think it's OK for us to bend bits of our rules that we might have had. I mean, obviously, what we're really striving for with our kids is balance. And so ultimately, that's what we're, we're trying to aim for. So for sure, they might spend more time on screens. Um, you know, they might have no option in terms of, of social connection to their friends um, than to do it via a screen now. So, uh, so I think we, it's not necessarily about limiting it, but it's just about finding balance. And so that's what we also talk to our kids about, that, that for sure they can spend time gaming, they can spend time watching telly, they can, but they're also going to spend time you know, going on the family walk or they're also going to spend time uh, you know, doing something practical or, or helping with uh, cooking or helping with chores or getting out and cutting the grass or whatever it is. Just it's all about balance. So, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I would be absolutely, I think, uh, negligent if I said, you know, oh, absolutely strict, firm uh, screen time, because I just don't think it's manageable. And, I, I, you know, we've enough pressures on our shoulders without beating ourselves over the, the head, feeling guilty about uh, letting our kids use screens at this stage. Um, um, I know over the course of uh, next week and the next couple of weeks, you've got live FaceTime sessions. Tell us about them. Where can people find you? Where can people kind of watch them and join in? Yeah, so I'm I'm doing um, a Facebook Live session. Um, so if you go to my Facebook page um, every Monday and Thursday at eight o'clock, um, I also have um, a course. Uh, it's called Scared Kids, um, and so it's specifically about how parents can help uh, their kids with anxiety. So that's also um, available. There's lots of links both for my Facebook page, my my own website. Um, and we've really discounted that. I'd love to be able to give it away free. Unfortunately, I can't. There's too much time and energy and effort from lots of people going in. It's not unfortunately free, but it's, it's very heavily discounted at the moment. So that also might be a resource for, for some parents if they want to look up scared kids. That's, uh, that's out there as well. Okay, and you're on Twitter and Instagram. What are your handles on, on Instagram and Twitter? Um, um, Instagram, I think I'm uh, at davidcoleman.ie. On Twitter, I'm at coleman underscore David. Although, to be honest, uh, I mean, people keep telling me I should be doing more social. Uh, fa Facebook is actually about the only one I can really cope with. I think I'm just, <laughs> I think I'm just crap at social networking. But I think everyone has their own face. Instagram and Twitter are my kind of two. And Instagram certainly is somewhere that I, I find that particularly at the moment is working very, very well because they're, there can be so much of it. Um, but listen, above all, thank you so much for joining us on Real Health. Yeah. We really, really appreciate it. People have requested you for a very long time, uh, so it's <laughs> great to get you on. I really appreciate it. Folks, that's it for another Real Health with Carl Henry in association with Leia Healthcare. As ever, you know where we are. It's realhealth.independent.ie and at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram. David Coleman, thank you so much for joining us. Folks, Bye -bye. stay safe, stay well, and I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.